what's up you guys welcome back to another top 10 commander video this time we're going to take a look at my picks for the 10 best commander cards from adventures in the forgotten realms this is the crossover set with magic the gathering and dungeons and dragons now before i get into the video first i would like to remind you that most of you who are watching right now are not actually subscribed to the channel so I would really appreciate it if you took a second to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos. So number 10 here, let's start it off with probably one of the flashiest cards from the whole set. It was spoiled pretty early on. Tiamat. Tiamat is a 5 color dragon for 7 mana, where when Tiamat enters, you get to search up 5 different dragons. Now this doesn't cheat them into play, doesn't do anything super powerful, it's just a dragon tutor for five different dragons. Similarly to how Conflux is a card that can search up five different cards of different colors. I would have put Tiamat a little bit higher if there was actual competition here for something like the Ur Dragon, but I just really don't think there's much more here that you can do for five color dragons by comparison. Still pretty good though, still definitely a creature you would want to throw into a five color dragon deck because you get to search up the five most powerful that you have left if you want to. And then number nine, we have Teleportation Circle. Now we get a mono white four mana enchantment that is going to act similarly to a Conjurer's Closet and that Thassa God from Theros Beyond Death. I have this in my top 10 because it's still going to be a very powerful ability to do essentially the same thing. You do have an option here, however, to go beyond just blinking creatures and you can do it for artifacts. It doesn't really offer anything new. Maybe the fact that it's white means you don't have to play it in some kind of blue blink deck. If you're just looking for good artifact synergies, you could just go for that instead. It's a pretty safe pick, I would say, if, if you're betting on it, seeing play in Commander. Just because we already know what it does. We already know it's pretty powerful. It's just redundancy now. We get a little bit more in blink. So number eight, we have Xanathar Guild Kingpin. Now this is a creature that I think is a little bit higher on a lot of other people's lists because it is essentially going to offer you a similar send triplets ability where you will prevent an opponent from playing spells and you get to pretty much steal something off the top of their deck and you can just keep playing the top card of their library. I will say, however, I think send triplets is still going to be better because there are going to be situations where Xanathar is just dead. If you don't have a way to play an extra land, if you don't have a way to get through those lands, you're pretty much at the mercy of their terrible top deck. I mean, stealing cards from your opponents, it's not going to make you any friends. So for me, it really is just another send triplets like Commander. There is the potential that you can keep playing cards off the top of their library. So it could be better than the send triplets in some situations, but you get white and send triplets and it, it doesn't do anything radically different. It is still very much just the same type of commander. So that's why it really didn't get much higher for me. And then number seven, we have old Nawbone. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, create that many treasure tokens. Out of all of the other dragons in the set outside of Tiamat, I think old Nawbone is really the only one that's going to offer you something significant in a commander game. It's not that the other ones are bad, they're just overly simplistic. With Old Nawbone, you get something closer to what's already pretty good in green value for dealing damage. So getting treasure tokens off of creatures dealing damage, that's pretty solid. If you have treasure token synergies, which we're starting to see a lot more, this kind of ability is going to be strong. And we have token synergies in general. We just got a pretty strong pre-con deck in green and blue that synergizes perfectly in token production. You can double tokens, so getting double treasures off of dealing combat damage is pretty cool. So this was really the only dragon in the set, I would say, that impressed me. The other ones are so-so, but what's really holding them all back, I think, is the simplicity. And then number six, we have a really cool land here. We have Treasure Vault. It's an artifact land, so you can take advantage of that in certain decks that are easily able to bring back artifacts from the graveyard to the battlefield. You can pay double X and tap it to sacrifice it so that you create X treasure tokens. This isn't something I think is close to being competitive, but again, we are going to see a lot of treasure synergies, and I think having this ability on a land, it's something I don't think we've ever seen before. I don't think we've ever had a land that will ramp us quite like this. Or not necessarily ramp, but if you have any kind of treasure token synergy and you just need to, out of nowhere, get yourself a handful of tokens, this is a good land. And we have some other pretty good lands too. I do like the man lands in this set. 
Man lands are great because they can ambush your opponents. I think any kind of land ability can ambush your opponents because lands tend to be underwhelming, but you occasionally get some like these that can offer you some pretty good value out of nowhere. And then number five, we have Volo Guide to Monsters. Whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, you copy that spell. This is really more of the same in green and blue. We just got, as I mentioned before, a pretty good pre-con deck for Strixhaven. It was all about creature tokens and taking advantage of that. This is yet another great card. It's a great commander option too. Your whole deck is just going to be filled with creatures that don't share creature types, at least not too many of them, so that you can take advantage of some pretty good ETB abilities, or really just any creature that you want to have more than one of. To me, I think this is one of the more interesting commander options because it does have that restriction. If it were just, hey, copy your creature spells, that wouldn't be as fun. And then number four, we have Orcus, Prince of Undeath. You could pay X mana, two, black, and a red for this 5-3 demon with flying and trample. When Orcus enters the battlefield, you choose one. Each other creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, and you lose X life. So similar to a Toxic Deluge, or the other mode, you return up to X target creature cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. They gain haste until end of turn. Holy moly is this insane. For red and black, you have graveyard recursion where you get to keep the creatures, you don't have to sacrifice them. You give them haste too, and what's even better is that even though you do have to pay a lot of mana to get a ton of value out of X, you have an answer, you have a problem solver on a commander option that can act as a board wipe or a way to recover late game. What's even funnier is that you can get a lot of creatures that don't cost much mana. It's very similar to why Nethroi is such a popular commander option. You really get your mana's worth. For each one you pay into X, there are a ton of good creatures you can get back that are not very expensive. And then number three, we have Circle of Dreams Druid. 3 mana elf druid that taps for 1 green mana for each creature you control. Uh, yeah, you read that correctly. Basically a nod to Priest of Titania, you even have the same artist here. You get green for each creature you control instead of elves this time, which is even better. I mean really, just having to pay that 1 extra mana doesn't really make it much worse. You're still going to be willing to pay 3 mana, it's just not going to be super competitive. And it's just great mana production. I mean, you get a Gaius Cradle here on an activated ability. What more can you ask for? It's an elf too, so you still get to keep a lot of those elf synergies. And hey, it's even a druid, so you get druid synergies too. And then for number two, we have Oswald Fiddlebender. Now, I think it goes without saying that just because some of these are commander options doesn't mean that's the only way they're useful. And I think Oswald is a great example of a commander option that's also going to be a great creature in a lot of other commander decks that are artifact-centric. So throw this into something like Brea, throw this into something like Sidri, it really shouldn't matter what your artifact deck is trying to accomplish. The fact that you have, essentially, a birthing pod for artifacts is pretty ridiculous. Artifacts didn't really need that much more search support. You already have some of the best tutors in the game for artifacts, but a lot of those are in blue. So the fact that you can sacrifice an artifact in white and get another artifact from your deck is great because tutors in white are pretty rare. You get some enchantment tutors, we have enlightened tutor, but the fact that it's in white means that you can also use this to your advantage if you wanna play an equipment deck. If you're looking to get another equipment, just pay attention to the mana value. And the card that you're looking for is going to be 1 plus the sacrificed artifacts mana value. And you get to cheat it into play too, so that's why Birthing Pod is so powerful. A lot of what's in your deck is unknown to your opponents, so you could end up getting a very powerful artifact. Now before I get to number 1, let's talk about some honorable mentions here. We have the Book of Vile Darkness, this synergy here that we have with the Hand of Vecna and the Eye of Vecna, the fact that you can then get Vecna off of that activated ability is really cool. I always like these cards where you have several different pieces involved and you have to kind of unite them to get the strategy going. It's a nice little game within the game, but individually I don't think any of these are super powerful. The book does make it so that you get some zombie support, so if you're looking to trigger that, it might be useful for your deck. 
We have Minsk, Beloved Ranger. I think it's a pretty cool commander. You can make that hamster into something menacing and then deal some damage with it. It's not commander damage because the token's not your commander, so that's a little weird. But that ability is pretty cool. I can definitely see some commander decks taking advantage of that. We have Skeletal Swarming. It's a cool card. I like the concept of a swarm slowly building up. But uh, in commander, this might just be a little bit too slow. We have the deck of many things. This is another cool one. Really does benefit you if you have a low hand size. So it's one of those weird cards. It's situational in the sense that if you're ahead in the game, it's pretty much dead. But you do get these really cool cards where if you roll a d20 and you hit 20, you get the best possible outcome. Kind of like with Dungeons and Dragons. So number one, the number one card from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms is Asmodeus the Archfiend. This card is ridiculous. Combining things about Grizzlebrand with Necropotence, you get something that is going to be very competitive. It's almost like Wizards of the Coast specifically used Grizzlebrand and then tried to figure out a way to make that fair, but the end result is still a creature with a crazy card draw ability. So this legendary devil god has an ability called Binding Contract. It's a trigger, if you would draw a card, you exile the top card of your library face down instead. But, you have these activated abilities which makes this not so bad. You can pay 3 black mana to draw 7 cards, but you're not going to draw them of course, they're going to be exiled face down because of that first part. And that second activated ability for 1 black, you return all cards exiled with Asmodeus the Archfiend, to their owner's hand and you lose that much life. So imagine if instead of just paying seven life to draw seven cards with Grizzlebrand, you had to pay a few black mana. That's essentially what Asmodeus the Archfiend is. You have pretty much the same exact outcome. There are just some downsides here that were added to make it a little bit more balanced. So you have to then pay that mana to retrieve the cards rather than just pay the life to get the card straight up. And you have to keep paying that mana if you want to get the cards that are going to be exiled every time you draw cards. That, however, in my opinion, is not enough to keep it from being an incredibly overpowered creature. Grizzlebrand was 8 mana, this guy's only 6, so it's definitely going to cause a lot of headaches. And hey, because the activated ability, it's all black mana, you can use Kyrix and a Yawgmoth. Pretty insane. So anyway, let me know what you think about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and my 10 picks for the best cards. As always, subscribe, like, comment, share, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos. Void here signing off. I will see you next time.